My name is Sherry Avila, and I will be your hostess today for Avila Fine Arts Lovers. Today, we are going to take a spiritual journey to Windows to Heaven, featuring Greek and or Orthodox icons. Uh, I became interested in this partly because I am also, as many of you know, a docent at Loyola University Museum of Art, or LUMA, and Loyola University Museum of Art features several icons, though they are more Russian icons of various titles. Uh, then I went on a uh, tour, uh, a Greek town tour, out of Mathers Lifeways, and while I was on that tour, I was uh, at the Annunciation Church, is it? Uh, and Faye and her husband Harold Pepinos uh, introduced me to a more a deeper uh, knowledge about the windows to heaven and the orthodox uh, icons. So I'd like to introduce to you Faye Pepinos. And Faye uh, has been involved with the uh, Greek Orthodox uh, Church and in both an administrative and uh, a teacher position for over 24 years. And Faye uh, has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree uh, in, the, and she, in education. And uh, she has served as a uh, teacher in, at retreats and at various schools and, and uh, ver uh, various places around, uh, I imagine, not only Chicago area, but all over the Midwest and maybe out of the Midwest. Uh, so uh, they, uh, and I also attended several uh, lectures uh, that were sponsored by the Hellenic Church after that. Uh, and at various uh, Greek Orthodox churches. Uh, so now, Faye, we'd like to ask you a few questions. And our first question is, how did you become interested in the icons? I think I've been interested in them somehow in, in my heart all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, but how did you mm -hmm. become interested in icons? Well, um, I grew up as, a, as an Orthodox Christian. So, of course, it was part of my life at home in a church as, as I was growing up. But it was a part of my life in a, in a way that was an, an ordinary way. I took them for granted. And then as an adult, I was asked to teach uh, Sunday school. And um, I used the icons as the foundation of the, the lessons. And in order to teach something, you have to learn, you have to really learn it. So I really began my study of icons that time as I found many things about them that I didn't know uh, before. And so that was then in 1996, um, we were docents for the exhibit at the Field Museum, uh, Heaven on Earth, that was uh, for the um, Siberian and Alaskan um, Orthodoxy. And uh, we were asked to do tours of the Orthodox cathedrals uh, for that exhibit. And we did, and then again in 2006 when they did Kremlin Gold, which was a thousand years of, of uh, Russian jewelry and art, and they asked us to do the, the tours again. And so uh, we went from there, and then we did the Chicago tours, and then continued. And the last things, the major things that we did were for the Hellenic Museum and Cultural Center, which you attended. So you have uh, been a docent at the Field Museum. Uh, during uh, various during the Orthodox exhibits that they had, Orthodox yes. exhibits that mm -hmm. they had there. Mm -hmm. That's a, a very interesting. That must have been a very interesting experience. It, for the, uh, it was, uh, especially the uh, the Alaskan uh, the the uh, heaven on earth, because um, we learned that the the Russian Church, which was an immigrant, it was it was a, 
uh, a missionary church and came their missionaries came with the whalers to Alaska and they converted many many of the Indians and to this day the, the majority of the Indians in Alaska are Orthodox and uh, then it came they came down went to made their first archdiocese was in um, California and then the earthquake came and so they decided to get out of California and they moved to um, moved to New York did I so, understand you correctly? Did you say that the in Alaska there's Greek Orthodox? Many the, the Aleut Indians are the majority of them are Orthodox. Oh, yes, and uh, in fact there was an, a wonderful icon in the exhibit that showed uh, it showed the, the volcanoes in uh, in the mountains of Alaska in because one of the the saints one of the the original f priests that went there later became. Um, he later became the patriarch in, in Russia and was martyred, or he was, became a priest and then he was martyred in Russia. Okay. And uh, so they have, uh, so there's quite, a, quite an extensive Orthodox presence there. I, uh, I had the fortune, uh, my husband and I, to have traveled to Russia and we saw uh, some mm -hmm. of the icons in St. Basil's. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I will never forget. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> and yeah. uh, we were very fortunate also to have been in Greece, mm -hmm. and we did see several Orthodox churches there that mm -hmm. were part of our tour. Mm -hmm. And I think we even saw some on our own mm -hmm. uh, when we were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have had the fortune of traveling around and seeing uh, the icons in their in churches, their settings, yes, in their settings, yes. as opposed to in a museum, right. Uh, now, uh, I think a lot of people are probably thinking, what is an icon? And I think when I first uh, came across it, I was actually perplexed myself. Mm -hmm. I wasn't real sure. So if you could share with the audience and help them understand better sure. what an icon is. Um, it, it's, well, the Greek word for icon for, um, is ikon, which means image. So it's an image of something. Uh, in the Orthodox uh, concept, it is a religious image. Um, and uh, it helps you to focus your thoughts on uh, while you pray. It, it brings the, the images and the events of Christ to the people because many were illiterate at, at, at the time. And so they, they would put them on the walls and on the, you know, the walls of the church and, the, and their own icons they would have, they would use for that. And the thing of it was is that, um, um, that, that oh, we've got, we've got the image up. Okay, there's three different types that we're talking, that, we're, that we can talk about a little bit. The first is the panel icon which is uh, the one uh, on the far right and far left. And that is usually made out of wood. It's, it can be many, many different kinds of wood. It has to be seasoned. There's a lot of steps that have to be, that you have to go through in order to prepare that panel. And uh, panel icons can be in a diptych where, where they have a second layer that's closed like a book. So you open the pages of the book and then there's a, uh, there's one on each side. Uh, it can be a triptych, which has the image in the middle and two, two like doors or shutters that cover the icon. And when you open it, you can see it. Um, the, another type of icon would be a mosaic icon, which is made out of a uh, tessery of, of glass or stone. And most people are familiar what, uh, with what a mosaic is. And then another type are the wall, the wall icons, which are uh, frescoes and they have to be done in their entirety while the plaster of the wall is still wet so they the the iconographer will will do a section at a time and he's got to be very skilled in order to make sure the paint you know the the pigments the colors match between where he started yesterday and where he starts today and so uh, there's uh, the fresco there's a, a fascinating book uh, called, um, uh, it's the Painter's Manual of the Dionysius of Fournat. And it was, they found, the, they found a copy of it in, in the 18th century. And what this was, was a workshop manual f of iconographers. And it's so interesting to read because it tells everything you need to know, down to uh, if you want to make brush brushes, you use badger tail, you know, badger tail for it. 
badger tail uh, hairs for it. Uh, it tells you how to mix gypsum. It tells you how to make the, the, the gesso. And it tells you, it gives you um, uh, descriptions of all of the, the different personages that are in icons from Christ to, to the Virgin Mary to all the saints. For instance, St. Peter should be shown with uh, a short curly beard and short white hair. St. Paul is bald with brown hair and a longer beard. And, and each of the descriptions are there in that book. So it's really, really fascinating. So there's a certain formula mm -hmm. that, peop that the artist follows. Very much so. And actually the artist isn't just an artist. He's sort of a, a, a serving God. Yes. Uh, an iconographer has to be a very pious person. They have to be very spiritual. There's there's prayer, very deep prayer that's in very, that's involved as they're doing the icons. They believe uh, through prayer and they're asking the Holy Spirit to guide their hand in in what they do. So they have to know gospel. They have to know, uh, you know gospel and scripture, and they have to know the writings of the fathers. If if an iconographer just arbitrarily changed something in it would it would change it could change the meaning just like you change something in the Bible if you change the whole sentence it could make a different meaning for it and one of the jobs of the icon the icon is to is to pass theology down from generation to generation accurately and so that's why it's very very important that they they follow the the prescribed rules and the way the icons should be done so that they don't um, they don't inadvertently put heresy or something in it because it is it is a writing of the church. In fact, they call icons uh, they're written. They're not really painted. They say if you're if you're going to do an icon, you say you're going to write an icon. So icons are written, mm -hmm. not painted, mm -hmm. even though they're not in text. Yes. Although some text is, is on, on yes. some of the icons. Yes, very definitely. So why uh, are icons referred to as windows to heaven? Well. It's like, uh, let's put it this, let's look at it this way. With, think about your, your computer and your icon. You know, you know what an, everybody knows what an icon is on the computer, okay? So when you press the key that activates an icon on your computer, you don't really, it's not really the icon you're thinking about, it's what it does. So for instance, if you press the printer icon, then you want the printer to do something. Well, it's the same thing with the, the, the windows to heaven. You're looking at the icon, but it's not the icon that's the, that's the important thing. It's who's on the icon. So what the icon does is helps take your prayers through to the person who's shown on the icon. And in turn, the blessings of the, of the, of the saint comes back to you through the icon too. So, and it gives you a, a chance to see uh, the spiritual reality of the people. That's why icons are first, when people first look at them, they, they're a little puzzled because people don't look realistic in icons. They, they look very stylized, and so they're showing the spiritual aspect And I was them. told that very often, or I mean that people kiss the icons, mm -hmm. and they touch the icons, and they be, want to become connected right. to the icon. And that, that's called venerating an icon. You're not worshiping the icon but by doing whatever action you're doing to the icon is what you're doing to the saint you know so you're showing your honor and your veneration to the saint through the icon so you're venerating the saint through the icon mm -hmm. i think your example of using the icons on the computer is a good example because most of the audience out there have computers <laughs> yes. nowadays yeah and so i think they can relate to right. that you know point yeah. now how do icons show spirituality rather than physical reality okay well there's very specific techniques that were used by the iconographers to do that and um uh, the one image that we have uh, that that shows um, uh, it it shows Christ and um, Christ and Saint John. Um, and we'll get to that. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. But what uh, the spiritual is shown through uh, taking away the physical reality of what you see in the icon. So um, the, 
the uh, figures are elongated. They're, they're, stretched, they're stretched out. There's specific proportions that are used in classical art for, for drawing figures. Well, they actually change these proportions in iconography so that the, the figure be, appears more elongated. And uh, uh, the specific colors are used for different things. Uh, and, and they're not like if, if it's the icon of Christ and you may see uh, a, a body halo around him. Well, in reality, you probably wouldn't see that. Well, but in the icon, they show it. And what it's doing is telling us theologically that this was an instance where uh, God was transfigured before the eyes of men. And so that particular um, body halo, which is called a mandorla, is only used in certain icons, like the icon of the ascension, uh, when he ascended, the icon of the transfiguration on the mountain when he uh, was transfigured in front of the, the disciples, and in the resurrection icon. Is it used in the Annunciation one, too? No. The Annunciation one is, the Annunciation icon is actually the icon of uh, the announcement by, J by Angel Gabriel. Or coronation. Uh, is it used in the coronation uh, of Mary? No, there isn't. There no. Th there isn't anything in Orthodoxy that that has to do with crowns of Mary. That's more in the Western. Oh, in the Western okay. tradition. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so what they do is consciously de-emphasize the, um, the the reality of everything. The the faces. Uh, um, the faces are elongated. The noses are very long and narrow to keep out the scent of the real world and the temptations of the real world. The eyes and the foreheads are very wide and open um, in order to be open to the wisdom of God. The ears are, are, are like cocked. When you see them in the icons, you can see how they're, they're turned. Again, open to the, to the, to the word of God. Um, all these different things, each one is a symbol telling you how to live. The mouths are very small and closed, reminding you to watch what you say. And so the symbolism is, is extensive in all different, very, very subtle ways. So the more you learn about the icons, the more you learn about the symbolism, the more interesting they become. So the body parts are symbolic mm -hmm. and relevant to mm -hmm. certain scriptures. Mm -hmm. You said that the eyes j tend to be larger mm -hmm. because the eyes the are supposed to the soul, to be seen. The window to the soul. Window whatever. to the soul. That's yeah. the soul there. Right. And then uh, the uh, mouth is a little smaller because you're not supposed to say evil things or bad things. Mm -hmm. And but the ears tend to be out more mm -hmm. uh, because you want to be sure and listen. Mm -hmm. uh, this reminds me of something my mother said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's all the same. You know, they're teaching icons. Are teaching. You know, they're, yes. they're teaching yes. uh, uh, tools. I mean, they, that was that was what they were from the very beginning, and they continue to be. You know, to this day, they still are. That's why they were so wonderful for uh, Sunday school yes. and for that, because the, the, they're they're easy to relate to. And you said the nose tends to be long and yes, narrow. Yes, long and, and narrow so that it keeps out. It filters uh, out the uh, reality. Evil, reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, now what time frame did icons 400? Uh, well, um, the, the, uh, the first icon was said to be um, written by St. Luke the Evangelist who was a who purportedly did it of an actual portrait of, not a portrait, but did an icon of the, uh, we call the Virgin Mary in the Orthodox world, we call her Theotokos. So that's where you're going to hear that word a lot, Theotokos. Theos means God. So Theotokos means God bearer. That's one of her names as God bearer. So as uh, Theotokos, he did the, he did the icon of her holding um, the Christ child. And that particular pose has become uh, the prototype for the icons of the, the, uh, the, the Theotokos called the Directress or the Hodogitria. And the way she's, ho she's, she's like, she's pointing to him with her hand and uh, telling us that he's the way to salvation. So uh, 
that that was the first prototype. Then, at the very beginning of Christianity, they did not have icons because the the law they were Jewish and the law was I shall I have graven images. And uh, then uh, I heard one priest say it so wonderfully. He said, after Jesus was gone, they it's like when you put a picture of your grandfather up on the you know up on the wall you want to remember him and you want to yes. see him and whatever and so that was when the, you know the images first first began and um so uh the 4th and 5th century uh was when they actually were um really really used a lot a lot more because by then the christian church had grown to be the state church and was there was a lot of uh, churches and places for the icons to be. And then further history, it was uh, there was an, a period of iconoclasm, which was in the seven and eight hundreds, and there was a, the big controversy came up again about whether icons should be used or whether they were being you know abused and shouldn't be used. And the 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 patriarch at that time. Uh, they decided, then the council side, they, the, the emperor did away with them, said they couldn't be used. And there was a horrible 150 years where they, they fought wars and they killed people. And, and it, was, it was a horrible time. And that's why there are very few icons left from before that time, because the only ones that survived were in remote places like St. Catherine and Sinai, the monastery in Sinai, or very remote places that really weren't any that were left because they just destroyed them and other things in history made you know that, that brought mm -hmm. them along but um, after after the, the the period of iconoclasm there was a great resurgence after the icons were brought back there was a great resurgence and and then they just blossomed from there and that same type of thing ironically has happened in Russia uh, with the fall of the communist empire and the, and the church back, uh, there's just been an explosion of I of icons and icon schools and workshops in Russia also. So originally, icons were not permitted because that was a, a they didn't even know about them. They hadn't done right. them yet. Mm -hmm. But it was considered at one point in time a graven image, mm -hmm. and so that wouldn't have been encouraged. No, but it was it was actually stopped, and all the ones were mm -hmm. were destroyed. And then and then afterwards, then they mm -hmm. then they were allowed. And then and when they came back and were allowed, they came back in the basically in the style, the Byzantine style that that uh, you see quite. Uh, quite often in the Greek Orthodox Church, and then the uh, later on, when after they had become popular, there was uh, a great turmoil of uh, wars, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it was wasn't it the uh, fall of Constantinople yes. in 1453, and uh, so then all of the Byzantine artists and and the iconographers had to flee, so they went to southern Italy and uh, melded there with the, the Italian artists in the Renaissance kind of, you know, went, to, went on in a different direction. They went on in two different directions after that. The icons stayed as part of the church and part of uh, the tradition of keeping the theology, while the Italian artists uh, in the West, uh, the church didn't, didn't have the same... Um, the same reverence. They decided that they that that there were just two different ideas about it, and so uh, the art went into um, j just religious art as art rather than as icons. Religious art as art. You more secular? Is that mm -hmm. what you mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, they would still show religious themes, but mm -hmm. they were religious themes and events and people, but they weren't used as icons. But in the in the East. They were continued to use as for prayer and worship, and and uh, they were still used some to, to that point to some point in in Italy also mm -hmm. because they were used in the churches and whatever. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, with the Renaissance art itself went on mm -hmm. to to go into a different way. When we were in Spain, I particularly remember seeing quite a few icons, yes. mm -hmm. uh, and they were my, they were the description that you know with the big eyes, mm -hmm. the long narrow nose, mm -hmm. the small mouth, and the ears that seem mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. so that you can listen real good. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> now I n imagine that the audience out there is wondering, uh, how do you make these? You know, what are some of the techniques for making an okay. icon? All right. Well, 
Um, as we said, the, you use the elongated, you know, the elongated um, uh, proportions. Um, and then some of the some of the ways that they they actually prepare uh, prepare the icon is uh, they have to get they have to get wood and they usually get it from the center of a tree rather than the outside and uh, it has to be seasoned for for years it can't you know so it's not a of course modern materials have made a difference in all of this obviously. Uh, in fact, one of the one of the things that that's changed is uh, um, use of acrylics in in making icons. Uh, the original ones uh, that were in Sinai, uh, that were the very very old ones, were wax and caustic. But they've never really they've had a very hard time figuring out exactly how that was done. But they know that that's what it was. It was the wax that that binds the the pigment. And then the next kind, the, which is used very, very extensively, especially in the, the more traditional uh, iconographers, is egg tempera. And um, I was fortunate enough to take a to take a workshop, and it was so interesting because I had never been exposed to it before. And it's actual egg yolk. You take the, the egg yolk, and, and then uh, you mix it with. Uh, put a little bit of vinegar in it so that it doesn't sour, and a little and water and you just the, the, you mix that with is the pigment until you get the colors you want, and then you go on you know you go on from there. Um, let's talk about the 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 um, skin color the uh, colors that are in here. Uh, the skin color is a very very important difference uh, in a very important thing in the icons, and this icon this this image shows you a good difference between the east and the west. The skin is always uh, in ochre colors rather than pinks and um, the when the when the iconographer does it he starts with the dark tones first and puts each lighter tone on top and uh, so that the the final the final layer which is the almost white will highlight the creases and the, the just certain very very small parts of the um, you know of of the the icon and and the folds of the materials and so forth and what this does is it gives the impression that the light is coming from within it's a shadowless light and it looks it makes it look like the that the light is coming from within the person which would be the divine which would be you know the holy spirit the divine grace of of the person and in the western in the western style uh, the light is from an exterior source, and the artist does the lightest colors first, puts the shadow on later, depending on where the the light source is coming from. So it's a completely opposite. Um, and here uh, we see the uh, the elongated figure, and in Christ the, the the full figure, and the that mandorla or that that. Uh, that body halo and the voluminous clothing and in John the Baptist you can see the the you know the the narrow nose and the other the other uh, things that we talked about so the um, there's usually a mandorla or in certain uh, images of mm -hmm. Christ there's a mandorla mm -hmm. to um, make the point of his spirituality right Th that's it that's his divine presence his divine, he, yes. like it, when it's in his glory like he would yes. be you know like he would be in heaven right um, in his halo um, uh, the Christ halo always has a cross within it so whenever you see an icon and you see the cross within the halo then you know you know that that's that's Christ because and it usually and then inside of it it'll say sometimes they'll put the the initials all on which means the one who is which is from directly from the you know from the Bible so a Christ halo usually has a cross in it mm -hmm. and the, the cross has words that say all what? on all which is the and on which is what one the oh. one the one mm -hmm. the one yeah and it doesn't always have it but often you'll see that now, uh, icons have a stylistic uh, distortion. 
uh, especially of perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, 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 some icons remind me of a period of art called the mannerism. In yes. mannerism, they have these long uh, bodies and maybe long arms. And actually, again, the, there's a purpose to some of that length, too, mm -hmm. uh, to maybe to reach up to heaven yeah. or mm -hmm. uh, could be. I mean, that's that's what's so wonderful about icons is when you look at it, it it talks to you, mm -hmm. and and you can you can uh, think of things you know different ways. Um, but the the perspective is interesting. In the usual perspective that we're used to is the singular linear linear, where like the the railroad tracks that start out and then they get narrower and narrower and narrower until they disappear in the back. And so it takes your it takes your eye into the back of the picture, into the picture. The reverse perspective is exactly the opposite. It what it does is it keeps it keeps your eye up at the front of the uh, at the front of the icon, and uh, so that that you're paying attention to what you know what is um, what is there. Uh, the the icon that's on the left is is one of my favorites. It's uh, the Annunci that's the Annunciation where Gabriel came to to uh, the Virgin Mary. And you can see the wonderful creativity in the in the wings and in the way he he looks like he's flying in uh, just in a rush and that it's something that's really really important that he's got to do and his his hand is outstretched to the to the Virgin Mary and she in, in turn has got she's got her hand up like oh, wait a minute you know what what's what is this I mean what would you do if um, you know, if suddenly an angel came yes. swooping down. I mean, you'd be able to, you know, she's she's showing a surprise, a reluctance, uh, and a mis not an understanding. And the only thing that, that tells us that is her hand, and yet it's so expressive. I mean, that hand just says it all. I mean, it just says it all. And it also, it also is telling us she was thinking about what God is asking her to do. She's got to make a decision that is the, that's going to change the world, right? She has no experience about what what she should do on this, and so that that hand is just that was what was so wonderful about the iconographers is they got they got the symbols down to just the perfect thing, so you don't really need to change anything composition wise you can change it like the angel can look different and maybe his wings might look different or whatever but you've got to show that same sense of urgency and and that's what's so wonderful about the icons in her um, in her left hand uh, she's holding a skein of, of thread and she you know she was uh, she worked uh, she was given to the temple and worked in the temple and one of her one of her tasks was to weave the the thread for the veil of the temple, which later on was torn at, at the time of Christ's crucifixion. So that again reminds us, and it's another detail that reminds us of, uh, you know, of um, uh, what she did. And the cloth that, that's across the top of the uh, the chair, which is made like a throne to be because she was she was would be queen of heaven right so the the cloth at the top is telling us that that happened inside whenever you see a cloth and an icon across the top of the building or whatever it means that whatever is happening in that picture happens inside and uh, and, it, and then at the very top uh, there's the little semicircle which is always the presence of heaven and the Holy Spirit uh, coming down in the ray, um, so that that is just a wonderful icon. The uh, and and you can see from the the um, the shape of the throne. What I was talking about the perspective. It keeps her right up front, right right in your you know right in your sight there. And the same thing um, in the Palm Sunday icon, which is on the other side, the the mountains and the the city walls are are designed to keep everybody else up in your your uh, consciousness there, and uh, there you see um, Christ coming on the donkey and followed by his his disciples and then the 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 Jews out out in front of the city with the children putting the garments down. Uh, the 
you can see writing at the top of these icons. An icon always is identified. It always has the writing up on the top that tells what it's about. And, and each of the figures are always identified um, also. So the uh, icons, as you said, they, they're teaching tools. And people were illiterate at the time. So actually, that helped them to uh, mm -hmm. learn the uh, stories, the stories, especially mm -hmm. in this case, the stories of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, it's kind of interesting, though, those little special pieces. Like you said, there's a little um, a cloth at the top that indicates that it's inside. Mm -hmm. the, that particular event took place inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's these little uh, symbols uh, that uh, give it, uh, help you understand it more and, mm -hmm. and, under, and uh, give it more meaning. That's right. Uh, now, icons are so similar over the centuries uh, in the Orthodox, uh, Greek, uh, Greek Orthodox Church or mm -hmm. the Orthodox Church in general. Uh, but are iconographers also restricted? Uh, you've already, in, in their uh, creativity, you've already said that there is a formula. Mm -hmm. So now, if there's a formula, can they still be creative? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. All you need to do is to uh, uh, is to just look for, uh, you know, look at the different icons that are around, and you can see how much, you know, how much they they are, how much they do differ, and um, uh, they uh, they can't change, but the 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 symbols have to be there in order to teach the theology. Because if they're missing, then the theology is not is not true, and so that because the icons are something of the church, they have to be true, and that's why it's you know it's it's really really important. And um, again, the it is as you look through icon books or through art history books, and you see the different there's different schools like. The, the Cretan school or the Macedonian school or whatever. So there, and and a lot of that changes according to um, like history, as we as we've talked about. If um, you know, if they're going through a period of great turmoil, that reflects itself in the in the icons. If it's a time of peace and prosperity, they're going to be probably more peaceful. It just like regular art does. They, they yes. do the same thing there too. That the art would reflect the time mm -hmm. in which it's been mm -hmm. created. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, we talked a little bit about this, uh, but how or how, why or can you tell us a little bit about how icons are used for teaching? Yes. Um, well, um, the, the, uh, the next image that we're going to see uh, has three different, three different instances. Um, one is an icon of Christ. One is uh, an icon of the Virgin of the Sweet Kiss, which we'll talk about, and the other one is the icon of the Pentecost. If you look at the first one, it's the icon of Christ as teacher or judge. And the, the initials on either side of him, uh, I-C-X-C, are the initials for Jesus Christ in Greek. Jesus, uh, the two letters, I-C, would start the... Um, would start the um, uh, the start the word start and end the word Jesus, and in um, the X C those would Christos would start and end the the word Christos. So in the the you need to know some of this, something when you're reading some of the writings because they they uh, they um, abbreviate the words, and also they they do other things. They can write the word laterally. But they can also write the word vertically, or they can mix the letters up. And they can have all the letters there, but they're not exactly in the right order. Uh, so it's there, but, but they, they make you work sometimes, which is kind of fun, because it's kind of like a puzzle. And there you see uh, the, the cross in his halo, halo as, as we were talking about. And um, uh, the colors of his clothing are even, um, are even a, a means to teach something. Um, his tunic which is the undergarment, is red. And red is the color of divinity. He was divine. So the red tunic would be next to his body. And he took on humanity, which the, the color of humanity is, is uh, blue. So the blue is on the outside. And 
if you look at the icon next to that, you'll see that on icons of the Theotokos, it's exactly the opposite. She was human, so the blue will be next to her body, and the red, she was given the grace of God, so the red will be on the outside. And um, the, uh, the icon of Christ as judge, you see the configuration of his hand that's blessing. It's, it's the, actually, it's the initials I-C-X-C that are the initials of his name. You'll see the two that cross at the top make the X, and if you the 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 straight the straight uh, the straight ones will be the I and the C is with the thumb the thumb area, and so he's blessing in the name of Jesus Christ I C X C with his hand, and the bishop and the priests and the saints that you see in the icons will also be using this same configuration of their hand because the priest never blesses in his own name he also always blesses in the name of Jesus Christ so that that is um, a very important symbol um, there of his hand. And of course, he's holding the gospel, which is the word of God and the way to salvation. So that would be another, uh, another teaching uh, symbol there. In the, the icon of uh, the Theotokos in the middle, again, you can see up in the, the top, uh, M-R-O, it looks like M-R, it's not an O, it's actually a th a th in, um uh, it's meteor, which is mother, and that's the first and last letters of, of mother in Greek. And the second one is theo, and the, the first and last letters of, of theo in Greek. So that we're telling us that this is the icon of the mother of God. And this is a wonderful one. This, the, the first one we said was uh, the directress that was based on the, the icon of St. Luke. But this one is the, the Virgin of the Sweet Kiss. And, of course, it's much more uh, um, emotional uh, with her, um, you know, caressing. They're caressing each other's cheeks, and, and she's holding him, you know, close. And uh, she, it's a much more intimate icon. And this shows the relationship of her to her son. Um, and, again, she has that si a sad, a sad countenance because she knows that there's going to be uh, suffering in in the future, and um, so that's a very one of the favorites of a lot of people of the Theotokos is that one, and then the third one is the Pentecost. Uh, this is when the Holy Spirit came down, and you can't see it very well in the icon, but there's little flames over all of the heads of the um, of the the apostles, and even empty space can be a symbol. The empty space between uh, St. Peter and St. Paul at the top uh, is the space that's left open for Christ. So it's left there on purpose so that we know that there's that, that's the space for him. Again, you can tell this was inside because we have the, the, um, the drapings at the top of, of, the, of, the, of the building. And in the bottom, there's a, um, a man shown with um, a crown and holding um, a cloth. And there's two different ways, there's two different things that, are, that they call him. Sometimes he's an old man without the crown, and, and they have written above him cosmos. Cosmos in Greek means the people. So he is the people waiting for the uh, illumination of the Holy Spirit to come down. And, and when he's dressed with the crown and dressed as a priest, then he's Melchizedek, who was the... Um, the priest in the Old Testament and who whose name is always mentioned in when a priest is ordained So that's how some of the teaching goes on now How are icons used in the churches when we were in Greece and even here uh, visiting the Greek churches? Uh, I noticed that there's this huge dome in the center uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it, Now was that where Christ is always in the dome? Yes, mm -hmm. the the image of him is always in the dome, and it's and it's shown. He's shown as Christ as Pandokrato is the Greek word for it, and it's ruler of the universe. And it's always a magnificent, very uh, imposing kind of a uh, you know kind of an icon of, of because it's ruler of the universe. But what's what's amazing is the church fathers 
thought this all through so well. Um, if as you this there, here's an example of the church, one of the churches. This is a church in California, and um, when you think of a Western church, you think of spires, you know, going going up. Uh, that are beautiful tall spires and you go in and into that everything is is going up and the, the Orthodox Church has a configuration of being lower and closer to the ground as you can see here and there's a very definite reason for that because the church fathers designed it so that the church is actually an icon of the universe so when when you uh, it, the church is always cross-shaped and uh, and it has the dome. So you go in, and the dome has the 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 Pantocrator, and in the rest of the dome, the next ring right below him in the dome would be the um, uh, the the angels and uh, Virgin Mary and John the Baptist. And then in the next ring down at the bottom of the dome would be the the these older men with long scrolls and those are the prophets of the Old Testament and their portions of the of their prophecies that are written on these on the, on the scrolls and they brought us the Word of God in the Old Testament then in the pendentives or the or the the triangular sections around the four corners of the of the main area of the church um, they're like upside down triangles and inside of those are the icons of the four evangelists so that's the next tier down and then the next tier down would be the walls and uh, the walls of the church and there you would find the saints and uh, the apostles and uh, the different events the baptism you know, the different events of Christ's life and then the the last layer the lowest layer is the floor and of course that's for that's for us that's for the people and so when you're in an orthodox church you're never by yourself because you walk in and the whole universe is with you and then there's one very imposing icon that's in that's in the front and you can you can see it it's in the apse it's behind the altar and it and it goes from the floor to the ceiling it's it's huge and that is where you see uh, the Virgin Mary uh, in the Iran's pr uh, position and uh, the reason that she's put there is because she was the connection between heaven the Pandograto and earth us she was the connection both physically and spiritually so everything has a place there's never anything in, that's done by chance it's always got a reason so Mary uh, is the connection between heaven and mm -hmm. earth mm -hmm. and there's a hierarchy within the structure right. of the church mm -hmm. the top level would be God mm -hmm. and Jesus mm -hmm. and then uh, the bottom the level is human beings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what was the second level again there's about? the there's the Pentecost and the next one is like those who are closest to him in heaven which would be the cherub and the seraphim uh, the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist they would be the, the primary you know the primary examples and then the mm -hmm. prophets are and then uh, the old, old testament prophets then the new testament prophets then the saints and then us so the saints are just above us <laughs> well our job our job is to become a saint okay. okay okay and there's a special word for it in the orthodox uh, faith it's called theosis theos means means god mm -hmm. and theosis means becoming more like god and that's our job while we're here on earth is is to emulate God and the saints so that we can come become more like God and that's why we have all these examples of the icons because they show us how to do that so the examples of the icons teach us how to be more like God mm -hmm. and to become a saint of sorts yes or maybe even a so saint you, you never know saint. you never know <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you never know <laughs> there are many versions of the yeah. uh, Virgin Mary uh -huh. uh, in the Greek Orthodox Church uh, and uh, why are there so many virgins or what uh, yeah, how there's, o there's over 500 names for her 500 in, names in uh, descriptions of her and, and some of them are just un absolutely unbelievable um, but that's it's it shows how she's made her presence felt in 
in situations all over the world, yes. actually. Yes. And that's why she has all these different names. And um, if we look at if we look at the screen, the 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 top left is shows Saint Luke uh, doing the uh, the icon of uh, of the you know of the Virgin Mary, and uh, he's doing. We said it was the directress where she's she is gesturing toward um, her son, and you can see another one right below that the the Theotokos, which uh, is a directress and was sent was sent. To Russia, so it, it is now called the Theotokos of Vladimir. It was a it was a ortho, it was a Byzantine, but it was sent to them, and uh, they they keep it there. And it was originally went to Mount Athos, and then copies of it, and so now they, they they call that particular icon the Theotokos of Vladimir. And then another example of the directress is the one direct in the middle at the top, but this one is covered with an oclod. Or uh, um, uh, let's just call it an okay. And it's where they use precious metals, silver and gold, and they make a beautiful design for everything else except the faces and the hands and the feet. And they cover the icon. And what that's just doing is showing more reverence because it's just grander and you know more glorious. Um, I thought that, that another reason they covered that up was because they were uh, in an area where they had uh, candles and the smoke from the candles would very often cover up uh, the, that, uh, art, that, the uh, icon. That could be, uh, that, that could well be um, because the candles do, do affect the icons a great deal. They really do. Um, it's just one of those things that you know, you can't really do a lot about, but that that is true. And because a lot of the very, very old icons, you'll see that they're very dark because of the candle. The but on the other hand, the uh, foil or the shiny material or metal or whatever it is they use for the to cover it, uh, that would be reflected in the candlelight too. So mm -hmm. yes, it's that would add to that divine right. uh, right. effect. Uh, yes, and they even looking. used precious stones as they did in this one. You know, they they even used jewels too. Yeah, and then some of the other um, the other ones that are um, kind of interesting. The one that shows the Theotokos and the Christ Child sitting in the fountain. Okay, the story that it's the she's called uh, the Theotokos of the life giving fountain, and the story of that is that um, uh, it was in uh, 450, and it was near the Golden Gate of. Constantinople, which was a very prominent place, and there was a lot of there was forest there. And this the soldier was going through the forest, and he came upon a man, a blind man, uh, and the blind man told him he was very, very thirsty, and if asked the soldier if he would get him something to drink, and so the soldier said, "Yes, just wait here, and I'll I'll go find you something." And he was going to leave to go find some water in a different place and he heard a voice and the voice said uh, Emperor Leo uh, and he stopped and he was he was a soldier and uh, he's he's don't go any further for the water there's water right here he said just you can find it right here and he said there's scum on the water take that and, and put it on the eyes of the blind man and it will heal him so the 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 uh, soldier did what he what he was told and the blind man was healed. Seven years later, the soldier became Emperor Leo, and uh, the the voice had also told him to build a church on that spot, which he did, and it was called the Church of the Life-Giving Fountain, and that church is still there. I mean, not, not that particular church, because it burned and they rebuilt it, but mm -hmm. the Church of the Life-Giving Fountain is still there, and the spring is still there, and pilgrims come from all over the world to go to that church. But where is that church get, again? In Istanbul. Istanbul. In, in, in Constantinople, okay. mm -hmm. and they still get water from there. That's yeah. a very interesting story. Yeah. Now uh, we've talked about Mary, but what about Christ? Okay. Uh, what what icons do we have on Christ? Well, probably the one we should we should mention since we're talking is is the Mandilion, um, which is the uh, the center one uh, on the screen, and it's it's actually. When it's in the full icon, it shows a a cloth that's draped, and the the face the face of Christ is on it. And this is this is called the icon made without human hands. And uh, there was a king in Odessa who was ill, sent a letter to 
uh, to Jesus asking him to come to Edessa to, to heal him. Uh, he was a Christian and believed in him. And Christ sent a letter back and said, I can't come, but I've included this cloth. Um, and it had his, the imprint from his face on it. And he was healed. And then the cloth was hung above the, the gates of the city and many more miracles happened. And so that is the prototype. That's also known as Veronica's Veil, isn't it? It's a little different than that. A little different than yeah, that. Yeah, but it's the same. It's the okay. same story where where the mm -hmm. imprint was left yes, on the cloth. Yes. It's just it's just a different. It's a different. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a small image of that at uh, Luma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same. It's the same idea, mm -hmm. and it was a and it was a, a healing. You know, it became a healing icon, and that prototype with the hair parted down the middle and the long brown hair, the shoulder length, and the the beard and the the Semitic Greek, the the Greco-Semitic features and mm -hmm. stuff that became the uh, the prototype for the the icons of Christ. And uh, so uh, uh, now we are going coming to the end of our uh, show. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to try to uh, do a quickie on what are the some of the differences between the religious art of the Eastern and the Western Christian traditions, and then we want to close up with. Uh, what should someone do uh, when they uh, see an icon? Uh, okay. So All let's right. uh, start out with uh, the differences between uh, the East and the West. Okay. Here we, uh, we have the two icons in the nativity. And you can see which is obviously the East and which is obviously the West. These were both taken from Orthodox churches here in Chicago. So they're, uh, you can see how different, how, how different. It, the icons had become. There's now a re, there's now um, a return to the Byzantine in order to bring the theology back because they, the 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 uh, the realistic ones don't show the theology. If you look in the other one, it tells us that uh, you know it, it can show more than one thing at a time. So it's got the the shepherds, it's got the three wise men on horses, it's got all kinds of different things in the icon that you you know that you. Uh, uh, that that show us about it. The main difference, I guess, if you wanted to say, the main difference between um, the East and the West is that the East has kept the icon at, within the world of the church. It's within the world of the church and always will remain as as that. It's it's a it's part of worship. It's part of the 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 life of the church. Whereas in the West, it it became uh, a way to show to show uh, mm -hmm. religious things and so the, that's probably the biggest the biggest now we do have a list of some Greek Orthodox churches that people can uh, visit uh, but uh, before you tell about uh, what should they do uh, mm -hmm. about, uh, to understand better? Well, I think the most important thing is to just is to just now that you maybe have a better understanding of it Enjoy them for what they are. Just, mm -hmm. just enjoy them for what they are. They and put the list them. up there. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like to uh, comment uh, now? If somebody wanted to see these Greek Orthodox churches, uh, they need to definitely make an appointment, right? Yes. Yes. And right. actually, uh, if they contacted you, that would be a good thing too. That would be yes. You could contact the churches themselves, or you could contact us. Yes. And so that would uh, then they could come and visit and see the Greek. Uh, Orthodox icons uh, uh, right. uh, with a group, or uh, and of course the the Chicago Office of Tourism. We have our tour every twice a year. Oh, okay. That includes the that in, yes. and you can go onto the website of the Office of Tourism and find out when. That's those a good tours. idea. There's one in the spring and one in the fall. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I need